for giving us that testimony. And, and, and the, the name of the church is Burnett's Chapel. Yes. Burnett's Chapel. How many of you be praying? How many of us will be praying for, for Brother Mills and for their church and what they're going through? And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we've had a lot of people sick, but, you know, we haven't, uh, we haven't had to have any funerals. And praise the Lord for that. But uh, that's an exceptionally um, big hot spot there where you're at. So uh, let's be praying for them. All right, thank you again, brother, for, for that. All right, let's go ahead and let's take our Bibles. I want you to turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. And uh, in 1 John chapter 2, and, and as I mentioned this morning, as I was talking about tonight, I was talking about, uh, talking about a good, safe vaccination uh, was going to be my... Uh, topic for tonight, but no needles, talking about a spiritual vaccination, uh, something that will keep us from error, because we see that in God's word, that we can be inoculated from error, uh, that we would know the truth, and uh, John speaks about that in 1 John chapter 2, also in chapter 4 as well, but I'm going to go ahead and take a look here in, uh, in chapter 2. Uh, the Apostle John has been speaking to, this, uh, to these uh, recipients uh, of this letter, of this epistle, uh, to, uh, to those uh, people that have trusted Christ, to those believers. And, uh, of course, just like all of the other authors, he's, he speaks to them about the importance of some important building blocks in their life, things that need to be a part of their life that, uh, that they can take and that they can integrate in their life. Obviously, the Lord is, is the one who does the work in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. But in order for us to be fully developed and become mature in the things of Christ, uh, he talked about uh, the importance of walking with Christ, walking in fellowship with Him in chapter 1, especially verses 5 through 10. And we won't go through and read all those verses, but, but that's what he speaks about, that we would walk in the light, verse 7, as He is in the light, uh, that we might have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, will cleanse us from all sin. It's so important for us to walk with Christ every day, for those of us that know Him as our Savior, to stay in the Word of God, to stay in prayer. The Bible says that we're to pray without ceasing. It's important to, to, as we go throughout the day that we're just always talking with the Lord and staying in, in communion with Him and asking Him for His help, asking Him for wisdom and for discernment. Uh, praying that He'll help us to honor Him and that our testimony would be pleasing unto Him. And you know, if we'll do that and we stay close to Him, we'll be in a good place just by doing that alone. And it's so important to be in His Word. The importance of, uh, of consistent and regular cleansing. And that takes place when we confess our sins. You know, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is so important for us as believers to, to make sure that we confess our sin, to make sure that our hearts are right before Him. And as we go through the day and our thoughts go somewhere where they shouldn't and we begin to worry or we begin to, to start thinking some maybe thoughts along the lines of bitterness or whatever, it's just good to go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. Uh, you, you can see what's going on in my heart and I'm struggling and it's good for us to stay uh, right with the Lord and stay in fellowship with Him. And so he brings that up to them, uh, the importance of keeping that fellowship. And then he talks about the importance of our obedience to the commandments of Christ, that we would uh, do all that we can to obey the Lord. And he talks about that in verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2. And then he talks about the importance of our love for our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Uh, over and over, we read through, well, all of God's Word, but especially in the New Testament, we see about the importance that we would love one another. People are going to see that we're different. People are going to know that we are Christians by the love that we have for one another. All too often, we've seen it in churches, and you've probably seen it. Maybe you've been a part of a church. Uh, you know, I've been saved 44 years now, and I've certainly seen it in churches where you know, people get an issue with one another, and they have, there's, and the Lord said, offenses are going to come. It's just going to happen. We are, you know, we have an old nature, and so often we can get off in that old nature, and we can offend one another, but it's so important that we would learn how to forgive one another. The Bible talks about forbearing over and over, putting up with some things, 
And we all have to put up with things with one another. We, do, we have to with spouses, husbands and wives. Nobody's perfect, and we all fall short. We have to learn how to put up with some things. We have to learn how to forgive. Because the Lord forgave us a great amount, amen? And uh, usually what happens between you and I is something usually more trivial. Not that it couldn't be bigger, but it's never going to amount to what the Lord forgave us of. And so we've got to forgive one another. Uh, and then he says that, uh, you know, how important it is that we keep that relationship right between brothers and sisters in Christ. Because one of the things that the devil wants, is looking for, probably, uh, well, it's probably right at the top of his list, is an opportunity to get into the church and try to set us at odds against one another. And then when that begins to happen, and then there is... Uh, there's backbiting going on. There's divisiveness. We see it with our country. We don't want to see that in our church. And so when, when the devil sees an opportunity to pit you against you and you against you or you against me or me against you, he looks to step into that opportunity and to, make, and to get all that he can out of it. And that's where we have to just keep the devil at bay by just obeying the Lord and so often, that means just humbling ourselves and going to somebody and saying, listen, we need to talk. I, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. Uh, I said some things. And then that just brings people together. And, and it brings about that ministry of reconciliation. God wants us to be reconciled. God says that he loves the peace in the midst. You know, he's not going to come into the midst of a church when there's a lot of fighting, a lot of infighting going on. He just won't. He doesn't want to be in that kind of an atmosphere and we don't want to put the Lord in that kind of an atmosphere so that's important that we that we're careful with our relationships with one another and then he talks about the importance of uh, being separated uh, from the things of this world just leading into where we're going to go we're going to start in verse 18 but verses 15 through 17 I talked about this a couple weeks ago when I was in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, where, where it talked about that we're to be blameless and harmless as the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We're to shine as lights and we're to, um, you know, we're to, uh, 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 as we live in this crooked and perverse nation, we're to be who we, who we are. We're sons of God, children of God, and we're to act like that and we're to be different. The, the Lord tells us and says to us very clearly in Titus chapter 2 that we are a peculiar people he said of Israel they were a peculiar treasure he says to the church we're a peculiar people we should be different and I brought that out again a few weeks ago about how we should how we should be different in uh, in our uh, you know just in our body language people should see a smiling face now you know not that we're never going to get down we're human but you know if we'll keep our, our our sights on the Lord you know set your affection on things above not on the things of this earth the Bible tells us and as we do that the Lord will give us a peace in our hearts even as we're going through some tough times this last year 2020 with all of the the virus and everything that played itself out look at our brother has been going through here in his church and we just think that's just unsettling in itself and then we we had an election that was just fraught with corruption and there was you know there was a whole lot going on there and and, uh, you know, now we have a president that we pray for him, right? We pray that he'll get saved. But what's come in is not what we would have wanted. We know that. And so we pray, though. And a lot of that can be disconcerting. A lot of that can be discouraging. But if we set our sights on, on who we're supposed to, and that's the Lord, then he will keep us excited. And, and I'll say this, you know, I think this is a very exciting time for the church. I mean that. I'm not just saying it because I'm supposed to say it. I mean it because... When we go through times where not everything is going our way, then the Lord is just seeking to bring his church to another level that we might, that we are, we might truly be a lighthouse in a dark world, that we would have an opportunity to, to, to win people to Christ, that we would have an opportunity to, to shine for Christ. It's not us that shines, it's the Lord who shines through us. And may we do that for him. So we have this opportunity, but may we be different. May we be different on our tone and uh, our, the smile on our face. And might we just be different? Might we look different? We don't have to look like the world. And I talked about that a few weeks ago. We don't have to, you know, uh, have to go in style with the world. We can be different. Amen? And we should be different. God expects his people to be different. We don't have to be weird or odd. Now, people are going to look at us as being weird or odd. I mean, as I mentioned before, you can still... 
you know, uh, you, you can still dress nice, but you don't, you know, you don't have to be uh, of the world. I think it's important for, for us to be modest. And I talked about that for, for uh, you know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy, and I brought that verse up about how it's important for young ladies to be modest, dress in modest apparel. And I think that that's important. Amen? And so he talks about that, and, and now I want to go on to where um, the Lord is looking to strengthen us for this journey that lies ahead. And uh, right now we're living at a time when really the devil is beginning to make more and more headway. He's making more and more progress into our country and into this world just because of all that's taking place. We are definitely in the last time. And uh, I'm excited because the Lord's coming back soon. And there's a part of me that doesn't really like what I'm looking at. It's like, okay, well, we have a, an administration right now that if it just continues to go with, with what they said that they're going to do, and that's the way it looks that things are rolling, you know, uh, you know, with big tech on their side, and now things getting censored, and now we're looking at down the road that uh, maybe our free speech is going to get threatened. You know, these are not things that we're excited about, but we have an opportunity right now to just look unto God because... Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And so as we look into God, God's, God doesn't get, you know, hamstrung by this. He's not handcuffed where, oh, well, I don't have the administration that I want in the United States, so I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do. God made all of this. And God is still on the throne. And God can work. In fact, he usually works through believers in a greater way because we have to learn how to trust him more. And maybe America is not going to, maybe we're not going to have all the creature comforts that we once ha had and all of the things that we once enjoyed. I hope we do. But let's just continue to pray and let's look unto God and say, God, I'm just excited about what you're going to do because you're going to do some great things. And he will. And he wants to do some great things. He wants to show himself strong on our behalf. We are in the last days, and we see that right here as we get into verse 18 in just a moment. But 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We are in the last time, and a lot of things are going to begin to happen. And one of the things, as we look at here, is the devil is looking to try to um, again, look for an opening, and one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to take uh, the weak Christian and uh, cause them to stumble and to get out of church and no longer be a factor uh, in their life as a Christian. Now, that's why it's important for us to, to draw close to Christ. That's why it's important for us to walk with him every day, and I want to challenge you to do that, and I challenge myself to do that. I have a long way to go, and I say that all the time, but I mean it. And I know that, uh, man, I have a lot of vulnerabilities, and uh, man, none of us are immune to falling into a ditch somewhere. It's only by the grace of God that we can live this Christian life anyway. It's by God's grace that we live this life. So with that, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look tonight at this, uh, oh, what I would call a, a sound vaccination against error. Father, we come to you tonight. We're so grateful to you. Thank you for, Lord, the, uh, the opportunity to be here tonight and to be able to fellowship with one another. We praise and thank you for your, your great goodness and thank you for the liberties that we have, that we've enjoyed in this country that more and more are being threatened. But help us not to lose heart. Help us to realize that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Lord, you're still on the throne. You are sovereign. You're a great God. And we we just want to honor that, and we just want to trust you as maybe we're going to go through some diff more difficult times as time goes on. We do know that you're going to come soon, and so may we keep our eyes upward and set uh, into the heavenlies knowing that you could come at any time. Would you please help us, Lord, to keep our uh, eyes in this book? Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, Lord, help us to be constant in prayer, and Lord, help us to always be about helping and encouraging one another. So we thank you for all of that. Thank you for uh, uh, the, our guests that are here. We just thank you for Paul and Cherie being able to be here. And thank you for Brother Mills uh, coming into the church tonight. Thank you for that testimony. We pray for that church 
uh, Burnett's Chapel. We pray for everything that's taken place there, and we lift them up to you and pray that you would help uh, them and strengthen them in the things of Christ and use our brother here uh, to, be, uh, uh, to just be a vessel that you can work through to be a blessing unto them. And so I pray that you'll uh, bless this, uh, this gentleman and his church as they continue to go forward and help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you. Help us to stay in this book. Help us to keep our focus on you. And we pray that tonight that Jesus Christ would be lifted up. I pray that you would keep me from saying anything that should not be said. I pray that you'd be pleased by it. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse 18 here, we'll go ahead and start by reading that. And uh, the point that I'm going to bring out is that false teaching will, will court the weak believer. Uh, false teaching is looking to try to woo uh, the weak believer there in, in its direction. And not just false teaching uh, in, in, in the sense of, you know, something that's not doctrinally sound, but just a lot of the, the strange things that are out there, the, the ideas and the philosophies and the narratives and the agendas. Some of those things can pull us away if we're not grounded and rooted in Christ. So it says here in verse 18, after he talked to them about being separate from the things of the world, he says, little children, it is the last time. We are in the last days, is what he's saying. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. So he's not talking about the Antichrist, but he's talking about there are many Antichrists. There's a, there's a, a spirit of Antichrist throughout the, the, in that first century, the things that they dealt with. And all throughout the ages, the Satan has certainly been working. And now we're looking at a time right now when, when more of the floodgates are beginning to open, just because of some of the things that we're seeing. And so we're seeing, it, we're seeing that happen here in our times, whereby we know that it is the last time. So we have to understand that we've got to be careful that we, when we open up a door, and we open up a door through disobedience, that means... When we give the devil an opportunity, uh, we allow the devil to come through it and to gain an advantage. And that's what we want to be careful that in our walk with the Lord, that we don't allow the devil to, to be able to have those openings. If we'll walk with Christ and stay in his word and stay in prayer, the devil, and as we praise the Lord, you know, as we get into James chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 5, where it talks about, uh, that we're to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that we're to resist the devil, and it says that he will flee from us. And I always love that picture. I love the thought of the fact that as we just praise the Lord and humble ourselves before God and resist the devil, he just can't get his hands on us. And he just says, ah, I can't, I'll give up on this one for now. I'll go get somebody that, that, I, can, that I can push over easily. And he flees. You know, as we just go along life's road and just praise the Lord and just thank Him and sing hymns and, and enjoy the Lord, the devil is like, eh, he's still praising the Lord. I hate that. I'm getting out of here. And that literally is what happens. Amen? It does. The Bible is very, very clear. May we just be a headache to the devil because we're just determined that we're going to just walk with Christ and keep our eyes on Him. And God will use us in a, in a great way. That's where Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. Let's not let, allow the devil to have place. One of those gaps in the hedge is to give opportunity for false doctrine and false teachers to move in to, to find an inroad. You know, you see it happen with different people in the Bible. You see it happen with Samson. He allowed an opening there. His weakness, of course, was with women. And he just didn't listen, and he, he didn't really follow, he didn't follow the Lord. He didn't obey him, and, and he allowed some, some inroads there. You think of Demas, who was at one time a faithful servant, but then, you know, having loved this present world, he departed, and he, something lured him away. I don't know if it would have been money or what it might have been, but uh, something about this, the present world, something that allured him and pulled him away. It shouldn't be a surprise then that if we begin, folks, to embrace the world and its ways and its styles and its philosophies that we find ourselves becoming like the world. And we don't want that. Now, Colossians chapter 2, it's a great verse. In verse 8, and I'll just read it to you. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, 
and not after Christ. We've got to be careful about following, you know, some, uh, you know, something that sounds really good, you know, or something that it sounds like a great cause. Now listen, God has called us as, as believers to, to follow Him. And yeah, there are a lot of good causes around us, and there are some causes that we can be a part of, but sometimes we can get so caught up in a cause that, you know, which is maybe a good cause, but we've left the best cause. You know, we've left the best cause of serving the Lord and, and of being a witness and of telling others about Christ. You know, uh, I, I, I want to be careful as a pastor that what God has called me to do as a pastor, that I would leave that and uh, 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 make that uh, less uh, importance in my life of less significance and then go off on something, some tangent. And it's happened to a lot of people. It's happened to a lot of pastors. So may we just keep our focus on what we're to keep our focus on, uh, on the things of Christ, uh, of serving Him. And so that's why the Bible says very clearly that we're to beware about somebody that, that somebody would spoil us or, or gain a victory over us through philosophy and vain deceit. There, again, the world is always throwing a pitch at us, and then there's always these things that we're seeing with, uh, with a, a new administration coming in, and, oh, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. And, and, folks, what we can find ourselves doing is getting sidetracked. And we get so sidetracked that we don't keep our, our focus on what we should keep it on. And so I just make that challenge to yourself and to myself to keep our focus on the things of the Lord. Uh, when we do, when we find ourselves wandering, we find that our level of discernment is very, very poor, and it's not what it ought to be. We begin to just not see things clearly like we should. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 is a great verse. It says this, that we, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Why, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, folks, it's so easy for us to be unstable as a little child. In a lot of ways, we're supposed to be like little children in, that, in the manner of trusting the Lord, just like a little, a little uh, toddler trusts his, his dad and his mom. That's how we're supposed to be as children. But not in these other matters. We're not supposed to be children in this sense. We're supposed to be developed and strong uh, so that we're not carried about by every wind of doctrine. Something that comes our way and we go, oh, wow, that's interesting. And, and we start to, to, to get enamored by this and we, we start to focus on it and then we find ourselves reading about it all the day long or sometimes we can get caught up with, with uh, things that we shouldn't. Now, you know, I like to watch... Uh, I like to watch Fox News. I know bro another brother says that. Brother, I think Brother Jordan likes to watch Fox News. Some of you like to watch Fox News. But sometimes I can get fixated on it. And you know, you know really, yeah, they maybe have uh, dissected things really well and, and really, uh, you know, I, don't know, I love Sean Hannity and all of them, all those, and I think they do a great job, but I don't ever hear any of them really say, but, but you need to keep your eyes on Christ. <laughs> They're not going to do that. All right, uh, it's good, and I like to watch it, and I and that's great. But I don't want to put all my stock into that. But sometimes I can find myself just getting getting a little bit over fixated on that. And so what I say to you is, be careful about some of these peripheral things that can sometimes draw us away. And let's just get back to the things that are important, and that is our walk with Christ. That we would stay close to Him. That we would learn to have a a discernment level that is excellent that is approved unto God. You know, it says in Philippians chapter 1, when Paul was praying, was writing to the church at Philippi, and obviously the Lord was in, had inspired him, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write that epistle, and he said in, uh, in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, basically he says that you would approve of things that are excellent. And you know what he's saying? That you would be able to have enough discernment to be able to... As things come by, say, yes, that's good. I want to get a hold of that. I want to get a hold of that. And, and let the things that really don't matter as much just go by. Approving things that are excellent and getting a hold of them. And those would be the things of God. That we would get a, a good grasp on those things. 
And folks, that's what's so important for us to do. Then he gets here to verse 19. In verse 19, he says this, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Well, this verse speaks of those who were once a part of the believers here in the early church. They were once a part of it. That's what he's speaking of. But at some point, they no longer continued with them. And John makes it clear, if they were of us, they would have continued with us. But instead, they went out that it might be made clear that they were not all of us. Now, I think primarily we're talking about people who never really came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but they were not of us when he says that. But I want to say this. I'm not 100% certain that it couldn't be talking about someone who is just not grounded in the things that verses 1 through 17 talk about. A, a Christian who, who doesn't get grounded and doesn't get rooted in the things of Christ can sometimes uh, just end up uh, getting pulled away because his focus or her focus is not on the things of, of God, not on the things of Christ. And uh, so I believe that, uh, that part of that could be a, 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 a Christian that hasn't gotten grounded in the things of Christ. And that's why it is so important for us that if we're going to be safeguarded, and I want to bring up this other point here, uh, this next point about the safeguarding against false teachings, against things that are, that are false or, or, or that are uh, of error. In verses 20 through 23, it says, it says this, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. You have an unction, which means an anointing, which means when you and I got saved, that the Holy Spirit came into your life, and He came into my life. The Holy Spirit is God. He's God, the, God, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And uh, what a wonderful thing that we have, you know, when Christ was speaking to the disciples in the upper room, and in John chapter 13, all the way to, verse, uh, to chapter 17, as He was in the upper room with them, one of the things that he said is he says that I must needs leave this world. I'm going to be leaving this world. And they could just never get a grasp on that. He kept telling them over and over that he would suffer, that he would die. And remember, even one time Peter chastened him. Peter said, not so, Lord. And then the Lord looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not savoring the things of God. You're savoring the things of man. And because, uh, you know, that just didn't sound good to him. No, Lord, you can't die. That's just not right. Perish that thought. And so the Lord was, uh, was saying that when he left, that someone would come in his place. And it would be the comforter. And that's the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you and I. What a wonderful thing it is that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and, and I know Christ as my Savior, that we're never alone that we have God inside of us, that we have the Lord always with us wherever we go. Now, there's times when we might not sense that the Holy Spirit's there. There may be times as you go through trials that you wonder where God is. You even remember David said in Psalm 13, uh, o, o Lord, hast thou forgotten me? Even David, who was a man after God's own heart, uh, even in his emotion, sometimes he felt like God had betrayed him or God wasn't there. But folks, we can state this uh, uh, with all certainty that the Lord is with us and that He lives inside of us. And, and that's just enough to, boy, you can just get a whole lot of mileage out of that one. It's just the fact that, Lord, you're with me and you said you'll never leave me nor forsake me. And, and if that doesn't put a little helium in your balloon, then nothing will. All right? That would really get you going. And it's exciting to just know that we have the Lord with us and this, this unction, this anointing that He that He came when we trusted Christ as our Savior, that, that the Holy Spirit has come. He's come to live within us. And it says in John chapter 14, maybe we'll just turn there real quick. John chapter 14, let's take a look at verses 15 through 21. John chapter 14 and verses 15 through 21. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. 
Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, yet, uh, uh, yet uh, or ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. So that was the promise that the Lord gave to the disciples, is that that the Comforter will come and be with you. And that is something for us to just rejoice in and to be grateful for. Uh, he says uh, that uh, you'll have this unction from the Holy One and ye shall know all things. Uh, you know, yeah, when you, you know, we say this, you know, we don't know all things. You know, here in our mortal, uh, you know, we, we have an old nature. Yes, we have a new nature that's created in the image of Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And yet we, uh, you know, not a one of us has got a monopoly on all the truth. Uh, you know, I like to think that everything that I teach is just so solidly grounded. Now, I'm sure I know that I've taught some things that it's like, oh, I, that's a little shaky. And none of us really fully grasp everything in that word. That, that comes from, a, from an infinite God who is, uh, he is fathomless. And we just based it, basically scratched the surface of things. Brother Jordan preached for, you know, as a pastor for over 30 years, and I'm sure he still thinks and says, and he's pretty much said these things, that everything that you preached, it's kind of still scratching the surface, right, brother? I mean, because we, we, we have a God who is limitless, and, and he's out in eternity, and uh, he's never had a beginning. Can you even get a hold of that? I can't get my mind wrapped around that, but I know him. And he knows me. And what a wonderful thing that is. But he says, you shall know all things. I, that, I believe that that means that all knowledge is contained in us. Because we have the Holy Spirit. We have, you know, we, we have all knowledge contained within us. 1 Corinthians, let me just read a few verses here in 1 Corinthians in chapter, um, in, in chapter 2. And I'll read verses uh, 14 through 16. And it says this, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. He judgeth, he can discern all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that, uh, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, and anything that we need to know, God will let us know, and it's there for us, and he's given us everything that we need in his word, and so as that verse says there in 1 John chapter 2, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things, and then verse 21 says this, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Uh, the believer is, is not left out in the dark, folks. The truth is always available to you and I. And God reveals that to us. You know, it's important for us, though, that we would come with a heart, um, you know, of expectancy. That, uh, that, we would, that we would really look unto God that He wants to reveal some things. You know, um, I've joked about it before, but someone, someone asked the pastor, you know, do your people come to church with expectations? And he says, yeah, they expect to be out by noon. <laughs> Listen, it's important for us to come to the word of God with ex some expectancy, that we would expect it. Lord, you know, Psalm 119, verse 18 says, be, uh, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The psalmist was excited. You could see that. He said, open my eyes, Lord, so that when I hear and read your word, that, uh, it, it, that, that, that some great things will be revealed. You think about the times when you've read your Bible, and I've read it many times and put it down and nothing happened and I went off, and that was just, you know, my bad. And maybe, you know, maybe we're not going to 
uh, bat a thousand with that. But, you know, the more that we come to the Word of God and say, Lord, please give me what you want me to have. And, and he sees that we come with an earnest and a zealous heart. God's going to reward that. God's going to bless that. I'll tell you the greatest times is when I'm reading the Word of God and then I know the Spirit of God is attending and ministering to my heart from His Word. And there's just times I'll just read it and it just, my heart just begins to weep because maybe God's goodness and the tears just start to roll down because I just think of how good God is. Now, do I say that happens every time? It doesn't happen every time, but I know that there are times when the Holy Spirit just steps in and just takes His Word and does amazing things in our hearts with His Word because this is the living Word. What a wonderful thing. This is not a, uh, a dead book. The Spirit of God lives in those words. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the Word. And as we want to know Him, who is the Word of God, we better be in this Word here and know all that we can about the Lord. And He, uh, he certainly speaks to us. Uh, he opens up the truth to us. And so let me just say this. Stay in your Bibles. Stay in it day in and day out. And, you know, when we've read it and we've gone, on our, way, gone our way and we know that we didn't do our best effort, we just kind of skimmed through it. We didn't really let God maybe speak to us. It's just good to tell the Lord that. Say, Lord, you saw what a, what a joker I was this morning. I read through your word. I, I read all my chapters that I read in my Bible reading calendar, but my heart wasn't in it. Will you forgive me? God's so good. <laughs> I mean, we as a mom and a dad, when our children come to us and they say, Dad, I'm sorry, I did a terrible job on the lawn. I just, my heart wasn't in it. And I would probably just say, well, go out and do it again, okay, you know. Uh, but when, when your children come to you and, they're, and they just are sincerely sorry about something, you say, it's okay, son, come over here. Let me give you a hug. I love you. We all drop the ball. I want you to just work harder the next time. And God's much better parent than any of us ever are. God loves us. And God's so forgiving. And if we just come to him and say, Lord, I've just kind of stumbled and bumbled my way again through it, I failed, there were opportunities, and I did. God's forgiving. And may we just learn to go to him. He's so merciful and so kind, but let us learn to just stay in the Bible and walk in the Spirit. That means just do what God commands us to do and just, just continue to just look unto the Lord and ask him for help as you go through the day. I mean, I've said it before. I think, I think if we're going to live a, a, a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, that, that, that we've got to just you know, constantly ask the Lord for his help. I think that, and I've said it before, I think, and I threw a number out in the past, and I'm just certain on that, that I think at least 25 times through the, through the day, we should be saying, Lord, help me. Help me. I know that I've done this a million times, but I don't want to just think that I've got it down. Would you help me with, with this meeting that I'm going to have? Would you help me with this situation in our family uh, would you work on that person's heart? Would you help me? Would you help me with how I respond when I have to deal with this situation? Would you help me as I'm out driving on the road and somebody cuts me off because I just want to just shake my fist at him and honk my horn? And, you know, here I have honk, because, honk if you love Jesus on my bumper sticker and I'm just shaking my fist at people because they're not driving like they should drive. You know what I'm saying? It's just good for us to constantly ask the Lord for help. Help us. Because, folks, we really don't have a clue. We've got to look unto the Lord to, to help us along life's journey. These things will be your means of growth, and they'll be my means of growth as we go forward. And uh, they will inoculate you and I from error. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6 says that very well. It says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And God will give us discernment as we just learn to, tr to just trust him. George, uh, George Truett was a great preacher. He said this, he always wins who sides with God. And he always loses who goes against God. This is an unfailing law of spiritual gravity. Uh, it is as certain as life and death, and so as we just look unto the Lord, the Lord will guide and, uh, and take care of us and direct us. In verses 22 and 23, let me just read those verses. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? 
He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Probably Satan's first and most often used attempt is to attack the person of Christ. He loves to attack the person of Christ and his deity to deny the fact that he is the Savior or the Messiah of the world, to deny his deity that he isn't God. But Jesus Christ is God. He is God manifest in the flesh. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up, into glory. Uh, it says in um, 1 John 3, 16, I love what it says there about, about the fact that he is the savior of the world. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, actually, let me get to verse chapter 4 of 1 John and that states it very clearly. Verses 9 through 14, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Folks, let us just get a good grasp uh, of our walk with Christ. Let us keep our eyes on him. That will be the greatest safeguard for us against, against all falsehood, against all false teaching, against any error. Uh, let me read verses 24 through 29 and just kind of just get into this last point as we'll finish up tonight. But verses 24 through 29, I'll just read through that whole passage to the end of the chapter. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. And that's saying that the Holy Spirit will, will reveal things to you and I. He is our teacher, and he reveals and opens up the word of God to us. And is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And so the key to being safeguarded against false or against error, against false teaching, and that is the, this crucial element of our abiding in Christ. Abiding, dwelling in Him. Having a, a very close and intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this word abide three times. The word abideth one time. We see the word remain one time. It's clear then that we need to stay very, very close to Him. And so the safeguard uh, against error is to just to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ to stay close to him. That's a huge statement that when you read verse 24, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. It's a huge statement to let that therefore abide in you. Let, let, let. It is an act of the will when we just allow God to do what he's wanting to do in our life. Sometimes we have a hard time just yielding to him and submitting to him. But when we do, and God is able to do his work, then God can, uh, then God can, can uh, make great progress in our lives. You know the verse in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says that it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God's wanting to do this work in us. 
And uh, I read this story about a young man who was struggling to let the Lord have his way in his life. And so he knelt to pray. And he had been advised to let God do the work for him, just as I was saying. But as he was kneeling, he cried, I want to let God have his way, but I can't. And he was, uh, he was just in frustration. He, he just yelled that out. And the, and the day before, he had cut out uh, some letters. He cut them out, let God. And he tacked them on the wall. And he rose from his knees, and with a feeling of defeat and despair, he left the room and he slammed the door with a bang saying, I can't, I'm not able to let God. And he went off and just exasperated and, and, and just discouraged. And on his, on his return to his room, he was startled to note that the slam of the door had loosened the letter D on the word God causing it to fall to the floor, and it changed the message to let go. And he said, I will, Lord, I will, I will, Lord Jesus. And he cried and threw himself on his knees at the side of the bed, I will let go and let God. And he did. That was a great, great little story there about letting God do what he wants to do, but just letting it go and giving it to him. You know, I think of that verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, and I think it's verse 7, that it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Well, yeah, we do that, but how often do we cast all those cares on the Lord, just like a little child would take something that is not a good thing and just take it to Dad and say, Dad, here it is, I don't need this, this is not good for me, this is not good in my life. Well, that's what we do. We cast all our care upon Him. But how often do we just decide to go back to God and go on His lap and take that, that care back on us again? And, and we take it and we, we make it a burden to ourselves because we really haven't given it to Him. And we have a problem with that, don't we? I do. I mean, uh, I think that I've given all my worries to God only to find out that a half an hour later I'm worrying about it again. You ever been there? Sure, we're human, but we go, Lord, there it is again, help me. And we just try to learn to just keep giving it to God. And God's good, and he's patient with us, and he takes those. And over time, we've learned how to truly give him those things. And that's what he's trying to teach us, to learn how to just let him do his work in our life. Let him just do what he wants to do. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. Ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. That's part of verse 24 as well. In other words, if you'll do as God asks, you'll be safeguarded to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If you and I will just simply obey and trust Him. And then verse 25 is a great reminder to all of us as believers. This is the promise that He hath promised us even eternal life. Uh, the Lord follows up that previous great statement with a promise, the great promise of eternal life, the fact that we have eternal life in Christ. What a great promise that is, that he's promised to us eternal life. It reminds me of that prayer that he prayed for the disciples in the upper room. The first three verses of John chapter 17 says this, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The Lord has given to us eternal life. And it's good for us to just get a good a hold on that. The Bible says that, that uh, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. In Ephesians chapter 4, that uh, this eternal life that's been given to us, that we were sealed by the Spirit of God. We're, we're sealed all the way until the day of redemption, till the day that we're going to be with Christ. What a great thing it is to know that you and I can't lose our salvation. If we could lose it, I would have lost it a long time ago. And then if I'd have gotten it back, I would have lost it again. You know, it, it's, it's just like some of the things that we, you know, around the house, it's like, where did I put that? Where, where did it go? Well, we would do the same thing with our salvation. 
But God says, you are secure in me, child. Now, one of the things that we can lose is our, is our fellowship with him. Not the relationship that we have. We're, we're always going to be a child of God. And as we get further away from the Lord, he, chastise, he, ch- he chastens us as a good parent chastens his children. And the Lord will do that for us. But thank the Lord for that because he's doing that because he's our father. And he doesn't want us to get away with him some things that we should not do. But we're not going to lose that, that relationship that we have with him. Let's just make sure that our fellowship stays intact, that we walk with him each day. Folks, that is just a, uh, it's just like a jewel that, that uh, uh, sits among, among some other great things, the fact that he's given to us eternal life. Uh, it's just like in the midst of some nice texting back and forth with my wife, she throws in some nice little emojis, you know, little smiley faces and a couple little hearts there and there, and I'm like, <laughs> it's just like, that's the spice of life, amen? And God just, uh, he just brightens our day and just says, I just want you to know that I've given to you eternal life and, and you're always going to be mine. And so, folks, we are just encouraged by those things. What a great, great thing that we have. And just in looking at this, that last part of this, uh, this chapter, verses 26 through 29, let me just read this and I'll just make a few comments. These things have I written unto you that, concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. That is a commandment, that we would abide in Christ, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He's going to come one of these days, Uh, We don't want to be ashamed when he comes. We want to be faithfully serving him. And we want to have confidence at his coming. And if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Let me just read something over here in John chapter 15. And why don't you turn there as we'll, we'll close here on this passage as the Lord Jesus Christ, again, up in the upper room. And the very next day, the Lord's going to give his life on the cross for for each and every one of us. But he says this in John chapter 15 about abiding. In John chapter 15 and verse 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Those of us that are in Christ, everything that is not Christ-like, that is a dead branch, the Lord... God the Father prunes it. He prunes it back. You know, I went out over here to this plum tree back in the summer, and and as some of those plums were coming out, and I see a lot of dead branches, I just wanted to cut cut as many of them back as I could. I had a long way to go, and I certainly didn't do a thorough job. But you see, there's a whole lot of dead wood. There's a lot of branches that don't bear any fruit, and the Lord wants to take those out and purge them. And those are some of the trials that we go through. And then he says this in verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word, which I have spoken unto you. Uh, That's why it's important for us to stay clean through this word. Just keep staying in the book. And then he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can can ye except ye abide in me. Those branches are not responsible for all the plums or for whatever fruit that fruit tree may be. It's just in the fact that it is abiding in the vine, that it's abiding in that trunk that goes down into the roots, and everything that needs to come up through that tree and goes out into the branches that brings forth that fruit, it's because it's abiding. And that's just a picture of what the Lord's saying. You are the branches, so abide in me. Be tight-knit with me. Keep uh, me in your thoughts always. Walk with me wherever it is you go. Keep your thoughts on me. He's saying, learn to abide with me. And that's what he says in verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, and he goes on to say that when, when we don't abide in him as we ought to, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Well, let me just get back to verse 5, that if we'll abide in Christ as a branch abides in the vine, then we'll allow him to produce fruit in us. 
He will begin to make us more Christ-like. He will begin to use us to be a blessing to others. Uh, he will begin to use us to, 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 to go out and have a heart for people that don't know Christ so that we want to reach out unto them and win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, our greatest safeguard is for us to learn how to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk with Him each day. Uh, be in His Word. Pray. Be open with Him. Uh, that's why it's important for us to just confess our sin and just to be transparent with Him. And as we're transparent, He's able to do a work in us. And it draws us closer together. And it keeps us uh, uh, more like Christ would want us to be. And I know that that's what you want. I know that's why you're here. And it's what I want. And yet, yeah, we still have our, <laughs> we all have our shortcomings. And we can still follow, uh, begin to walk after the, the, the carnal nature uh, maybe because of disappointments or something that's gone on in our life, it's just good for us to stop, be an encouragement to one another, uh, be under preaching and teaching, get our hearts right with God, and just get our focus back on Him. And as we do that, then uh, the, Lord will, the Lord will be pleased and the Lord will be able to use each and every one of us. So folks, I say that to me this is a great, the greatest of all vaccinations in a spiritual sense for us to to get ourselves in a place where, uh, where God can reveal to us His truths and keep us away from error because every one of us are vulnerable and there's not a one of us that are immune to that. But when we keep our eyes on Him, the Lord will direct our paths. Amen? So with that, let's go ahead. We'll bow our heads in, in, uh, at this time and we'll go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. But uh, with your heads bowed, and your eyes closed. Maybe God's spoken to your heart just about maybe you're, where you're at in your relationship and your walk with Christ. I hope that everybody here knows Christ as your Savior. If you're not, then I certainly want to make that invitation to trust Christ as your Savior. He died on a cross for you that you can be saved. And just as we came to know Christ, we want to see you come to trust Christ as your Savior as well. But if you're here and you know Christ, and maybe He's spoken to your heart, the Spirit of God worked in your heart and Maybe brought up some things about where you're at in your relationship and your walk with Him. It, it is so vital and significant and important in our life that we would just yield and surrender to Him each and every day and walk with Him and be in this Word and allow God to reveal the things in our hearts and our lives that He wants to reveal, things that we need to turn over to Him, things that we need to get right in our lives. Uh, maybe God has pointed out something tonight. So I want to encourage you to respond to Him. This is a good, good time to maybe come to the altar and talk to the Lord. Maybe there at your seat, if God has spoken to your heart. We serve a great God. He loves us. May we just certainly turn our lives over unto Him. He's worthy of that. It's our reasonable service, the Bible says, if we just turn our lives over unto Him and let Him use us the way He wants to. With that, let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to learn how to abide in Christ. Help us to learn how to have that intimate walk with you. Lord, help us to be open and forthcoming with you. Help us not to try to hide something like Achan did, but help us to simply be transparent, allow you to do your work in, in us. Lord, we want you to be able to make progress in our lives. We want Christ to be seen in us. We want to be a blessing to one another. And Lord, we want to certainly fulfill your commandments and to, uh, to, to, to obey you. We want to be Christians that go out and tell others about Christ. And Lord, we're living in a time when uh, there's a lot of darkness in, the, in our country. And Lord, we can, uh, we can be uh, overwhelmed by it. But Lord, help us to live above that. And the only way we're going to do that is if we walk with you. Only by your power, only by your strength. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. We pray, Lord, that we'll be able to see the victory in our lives, that we'll be able to have opportunities to see others come to know Christ, for you to do what you want in this church. It's your church. We just thank you that we have an opportunity to be a part of it. We praise and thank you tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.